Okay, um, so good afternoon to people in, in, in this time zone and also good morning and good evening to people in other zones. Uh, so I'm Zia, I will be coordinating and, and moderating today's session. So, um, well, um, today we have Professor Ji Chen here with us and as I believe all of us here are probably well familiar with him. And Ji Chen is Chair and Chen Yutong, uh, Professor in Finance at the University of Hong Kong. and. He's also the director of the Center for Quantitative History and the director uh, for the Hong Kong Institute of Community and Social Sciences. Um, so, um, I mean, I can just go on and on to introduce uh, Jewish paper, but in short, um, Jewish research covers finance, uh, finance history, the sociology of finance, economic history, quantitative history, and emerging markets, as well as China's economy and capital markets. And um, as you, we have already seen for, from the uh, introduction slides um, today, so we will talk about his study, War and Origins of Chinese Civilizations. So um, before we move on, uh, let me also introduce our panelists for the discussion today. So firstly, we have uh, Professor Chen Shuo uh, as, uh, as our dis discussant here. So Chen Shuo is a professor of economics at Fudan University, and his research interest lies in the Development, economics, political economy, and economic history of China. And also together with us here today is uh, Professor Ma Chen, who is also from the University of Hong Kong. And um, so uh, now we will just uh, hand over the stage to Zhu. And so the talk will last about an hour long, and then uh, which will follow followed by uh, Chen Shu's discussion in uh, about fifteen minutes. Then for the lots of the time, for the rest of the time, we will have a QA session. So if you have any questions regarding uh, any parts of the presentation, so please leave your question to the uh, QA part and later on I will just uh, read it out to our speaker. Okay, so without further ado, I will just uh, mute myself and hand over the stage to you. Too. Okay. Uh... Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Zan, for the uh, introduction. So uh, today, uh, of course, uh, I'm going to give uh, um, a presentation on my joint work uh, with uh, Peter Token and also uh, Wanda. Um, so the topic, of course, is not uh, financial. It's not about financial markets, but rather it's about uh, war and the origins of uh, uh, Chinese civilization. So in the interest of time, let me uh, go directly uh, uh, into uh, the talk uh, for today. Um, so uh, of course, uh, as part of the motivation, uh, I wanna show you uh, this uh, map on the left-hand side, uh, which uh, covers the period from uh, 8,000 uh, BCE to roughly 1,700 BCE. Uh, so over that uh, roughly 6,000 uh, 6, year period, um, you know, a lot of things happened uh, in China. But in this uh, picture, uh, what you are seeing are two main uh, 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 variables or indicators. Uh, first, uh, uh, you see the different uh, cells. Uh, um, so, the, so in other words, uh, what we have done here is to divide uh, the landmass of uh, China, you know, China's territory of today uh, into 100 by 100 uh, kilometer cells. Uh, altogether, we end up with about 1,004 of them. And then for each cell, um, uh, what you can see are the different yellow dots, okay? So the size of each uh, yellow dot uh, uh, stands for uh, the number of, uh, for the number, uh, stand for the number of fortified settlements or, or walled cities, uh, as we would like to say, okay? You can see that, uh, you know, most of the uh, big re uh, yellow uh, circles uh, 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 located uh, along the Yangtze River and north of the Yangtze River. So in general, I refer to the Yangtze River and north of it uh, as uh, Northern China uh, or, or the North. So this is one first uh, uh, striking uh, uh, pattern that is most of the early developments uh, during the 
uh, Chinese uh, Neolithic uh, period occurred uh, along the Yangtze River uh, and north of that Yangtze River in northern China. So that's the first uh, variable to pay attention to. Uh, the second uh, uh, um, uh, color is the different uh, levels of of blue. Okay, so basically, uh, the the darker the blue color, uh, the more archaeological sites uh, that archaeologists have di discovered so far. So the intensity of the color of the blue color for each cell uh, indicates uh, the number of uh, archaeological sites. So roughly speaking, uh, we can view the number of archaeological sites for each site as capturing or as proxying for the amount of uh, human activities or the amount of uh, development uh, each uh, cell, each location uh, achieved uh, during the uh, Neolithic period. So you can uh, then see that many of the dark blue cells lie in northern China. Uh, very, very few uh, uh, lie uh, in the south of China, especially not many uh, are there uh, south of the Yangtze River. So because of this uh, uh, pattern, we can observe based on the uh, yellow circles and then uh, the uh, blue uh, cells, we can roughly draw the conclusion that, you know, at least all the way up until about uh, 3,700 years ago, uh, much of the development, including civilizational development, uh, occurred in northern China, but not so much in the south uh, of the Yangtze River. Of course, you know, right now we are located uh, in Hong Kong, uh, part of uh, Guangdong province. Uh, there was not really that much development uh, uh, until uh, much later times. Uh, so during prehistoric times, uh, much of the uh, story uh, of development, uh, as far as China is concerned, uh, happened uh, in northern China, but not so much in the south. So what about later periods? So I want to give you a very quick uh, sense of how uh, the spatial distribution of development uh, throughout uh, uh, Chinese prehistory, as well as historical times, um, in order to give you that quick sense, uh, here I want to show you uh, the 30 uh, uh, largest uh, cities at each point in time in Chinese history. So we start with the Western Han Dynasty, uh, so roughly uh, reflecting the uh, spatial distribution of the top 30 cities uh, as of the year 2, okay, 2 CE, okay. Then you can see that uh, even up to this time, uh, towards the end of the Western Han Dynasty, uh, there was not that much development in southern China. So almost all the advanced uh, development uh, was happening in northern China. Okay, uh, and then even up to the uh, Tang Dynasty, uh, up to uh, the year 742, of course, now we see a little bit more life, uh, a little bit uh, of development uh, being shifted uh, from northern China to uh, uh, the uh, 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 Yangtze River uh, Delta region, uh, where today's uh, Shanghai, Nanjing, and Hangzhou are located. Uh, so you can see that from the Han Dynasty all the way to the Tang Dynasty, uh, uh, then things uh, were becoming more interesting. Uh, some life uh, was occurring uh, along the coastal, uh, the uh, east, uh, southeastern coastal line. But by the uh, uh, middle of the uh, northern or the late northern Song Dynasty, then uh, you know much of the uh, and many of the thirty largest cities in China uh, uh, were not just uh, uh, appearing in northern China, but also uh, in the south. Uh, so of course uh, you know we know during that period uh, from the early Tang Dynasty. Uh, to the uh, end of the Yuan Dynasty, uh, uh, the maritime uh, uh, trade uh, along the uh, uh, Western Pacific, uh, you know, created 
uh, the Chinese South. Um, and of course, today I'm not going to focus too much on that. Uh, and then uh, throughout the Ming Dynasty uh, and then the Qing Dynasty, um, not much change. Uh, so basically the uh, same level of uh, spatial breadth and uh, width of uh, major developmental centers uh, in China uh, were more or less uh, of the same shape and form as during the, uh, 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 the Song Dynasty. And of course, uh, after the uh, reforms started in 1978, then things became much more interesting because as of uh, the year 2021, the 30 largest cities of China now uh, spread uh, across uh, uh, much of the country, except maybe uh, the Western part of the country. Okay, so basically, uh, you know, what we have seen so far, uh, what I've shown you so far is this general uh, impression that the early civilizational development in China uh, occurred in the North. And then uh, later economic development uh, after the uh, imperial period started, you know, uh, around uh, 2021 BCE, you know, we more or less have kept the same spatial distribution of development, uh, you know, concentrated in Northern China, not so much in the South. It was only uh, uh, from the early uh, Tang Dynasty uh, onward, so roughly from the early uh, 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 seventh, uh, the early eighth century onward, then you know uh, uh, the South started to uh, emerge. Okay, so uh, we try to explain why uh, development in Chinese uh, prehistory and history first started in the North. So we want to use uh, war as the main, main driver <clears throat> of uh, that prehistoric and early historic uh, experience uh, in uh, Chinese uh, prehistory and, uh, uh, and history. Uh, so before um, I, I give you a, a more detailed presentation, so here is a quick summary of our main findings. Uh, first, during the Neolithic, <clears throat> from about 10,000 years ago, all the way to about uh, 2,000 years ago, uh, lower terrain ruggedness, that is uh, flatter lands, uh, had more walled cities or fortified settlements, uh, uh, which would be what we call uh, early cradles of civilization. So somehow uh, uh, flat lands were uh, associated with more uh, agglomeration uh, in terms of development, more, uh, uh, you know, high population density uh, 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 settlements. Um, so that's the first finding, uh, which basically gives a description of what we have seen uh, visually based on the different uh, uh, maps. And then secondly, flatter regions are also shown to have more military grave artifacts during the Neolithic period, as well as during the early historic period, uh, which somehow uh, indicated, uh, indicates um, a link uh, between war on the one hand and the start of the civilizational process. So that's the second uh, finding I want to point out. The third finding is that in order to confirm this causality link, uh, between war on the one hand and the uh, launching of the civilizational development process in uh, Chinese prehistory, we want to use uh, uh, data from both uh, the Neolithic period and then the Eastern Zhou period, uh, which goes from roughly 770 to um, um, uh, 221 BCE, to show that flatter regions had indeed significantly more walls. Uh, which caused uh, the locals in these regions to build more fortified cities for defensive uh, purpose. So in other words, warfare preparation, warfare related uh, uh, efforts drove the northerners uh, into uh, uh, you know, uh, the construction of fortification uh, for, uh, infrastructure as well as uh, unintentionally uh, building larger 
communities with a high uh, population intensity, uh, population density. Okay. So uh, lastly, uh, as the north of China had generally flatter terrains and hence they faced more wars. So the Chinese civilization originated there, okay, rather than in the south. Uh, so we have uh, a lot of evidence to uh, show that warfare, not flood, uh, not ir irrigation control, uh, started uh, the Chinese civilization uh, in the north. Okay, so now let's get into uh, um, the more details, um, uh, more, de more detailed uh, aspects of our research uh, in order to uh, give us uh, the confidence that uh, you know the conclusions or the findings I just uh, highlighted uh, are supported by evidence. So first, the big question is what drove the emergence of civilization or the or uh, uh, the development of the civilization process? In order to address this question, uh, we first have to settle on the definition of what we mean by a civilization. So here, I gave a definition that's a little bit unusual, okay? So here by uh, a civilization, we mean a collection of cultural, social, and organizational, institutional, and technological innovations that collectively established law and order uh, in this uh, uh, human society and affords peaceful, Inter uh, interpersonal cooperation in a complex society. Uh, so uh, uh, based on this definition, uh, uh, you know, civilization uh, start, begins uh, where chaos and insecurity end. Uh, this is based on the definition by uh, Durant uh, in his book uh, published in 1935. So in other words, a civilized society or complex society differs from uh, an uncivilized, a more primitive society, mainly based on uh, the um, uh, on uh, the test that uh, uh, there is uh, whether whether there is um, still chaos and insecurity, or there is uh, enough. Uh, a high degree uh, of um, uh, law and order. So this is uh, what we uh, really pay attention to, whether the society has a reasonable amount of law and order. Uh, if it has uh, achieved that level uh, uh, of law and order, then we say, uh, you know, at least it represents uh, an early civilization. Okay, so that's the basic uh, definition we want to keep in mind. So I want to uh, use this definition to really make what we, we mean by a, a civilization, especially an early civilization, uh, really differs from what we mean by a state. Uh, it should be very clear. Uh, a state is a much higher level uh, of a uh, so, uh, complex society uh, um, or a polity uh, that not only has uh, law and order, but uh, it, uh, it's supported by a lot of complicated uh, administrative uh, hierarchy and uh, uh, law enforcement uh, institutions and so on. Uh, so the existing literature uh, is relative large, relatively large uh, on the origins of uh, uh, the state or civilization. So here, just very quickly, uh, we can list uh, four of them. <clears throat> the first uh, one of the most, uh, most well-known uh, hypothesis in explaining the emergence of uh, uh, civilization or the emergence of state um, is this uh, hydraulic civilization hypothesis uh, proposed by this German scholar, uh, Witt Vogel, uh, back in uh, 1957. Uh, his main point is that uh, the need for flood control and irrigation management uh, that gave rise uh, to uh, the state uh, as a polity or a, 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 as a particular high level form of uh, social complexity. And then uh, war made the state and the state made war hypothesis uh, proposed by uh, this uh, famous political sci scientist, uh, Charles Tilley, um, back in 1975. Uh, so here the point is, uh, of course, he derived this hypothesis mostly based on 
uh, the European medieval and modern uh, experience. And then related to this is a lot of the work by uh, Peter Token uh, in his uh, you know uh, papers and many books. Uh, basically, uh, war is also uh, uh, shown to be a major driver for the emergence of uh, large kingdoms or the state, and in particular, large empires. Um, and then uh, the third hypothesis is that um, you know advancements in military technology and war threats uh, from the step. Uh, um, caused uh, state polities uh, to emerge and develop. So this is one of the uh, derivative uh, uh, research areas uh, uh, by Peter Token and many others uh, uh, based on data from uh, the uh, period uh, uh, from uh, 1500 uh, BCE all the way to 1500 CE, so covering this uh, 3000 year uh, Eurasian uh, uh, experience. And then more recently, uh, the perishability of domesticated crops uh, is shown to have triggered uh, the development of law and order uh, based on this uh, recent publication by uh, May Shaw and uh, his co-authors. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, but here I, I want to first also point out that state politics arose uh, in human history much later uh, than uh, the e early emergence of uh, cities and uh, early civilizations. Uh, so this is why, you know, uh, what we try to uh, focus on is the pre-state experience because, you know, when and how uh, the early forms of uh, uh, civilizational uh, 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 societies or uh, civilized societies uh, is what we focus on, even though those uh, early complex societies may not have uh, developed, uh, you know, complex uh, state uh, polities. So let me spend a little bit more time on why uh, we treat uh, the uh, emergence of walled cities or fortified settlements as this uh, this start uh, as the starting point of early human civilizations. Uh, so there is a relatively large literature if we go back uh, to the first half of the uh, 20th century. So one of the uh, 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 authors in this area is uh, Louis Mumford. Uh, uh, he wrote this uh, nice book on uh, the history of the city. Uh, so he attributes uh, city uh, a lot of the early civilizational development uh, to the formation and the construction uh, of uh, physical walls and then the resulting uh, walled city societies. Uh, so to him, the wall uh, was both a physical rampart uh, for defense and a spiritual boundary of even greater significance, for it preserved those within from the chaos and formless evil that encompassed them. Okay, so uh, the, the, his definition uh, uh, or, or description of what uh, the war, the city war, did is uh, uh, very close, uh, very similar uh, to uh, uh, Durant's definition of what do we mean by a civilization? Uh, so he further goes, uh, the city almost from its earliest emergence brought with it the expectation of intensified struggle within, okay? A thousand little wars were fought in the marketplace, in the law courts, in the ball game or the arena. So what this passage really uh, says is that, you know, what maybe the construction of physical uh, uh, city walls uh, may have been uh, 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 driven or may have been based on uh, defensive considerations uh, uh, in order to protect people, the locals, uh, from uh, uh, foreign attacks. Uh, but even though uh, the, 40, the construction of fortified settlement may have been for defensive uh, purposes, but unintentionally, once you have hundreds or even thousands of humans uh, 
uh, encircled uh, by city walls within a very small uh, 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 physical location, then that generated a, a new needs, a new demands uh, for law and order. Because you know, without establishing law and order within the fortified communities, you know, a thousand little wars uh, would happen. Uh, they would ha they would be just too much uh, physical viol violence uh, within the wall cities, so life would not be worth living there. And then the law courts and many other uh, dispute uh, uh, places and conflicts uh, would all emerge unless, you know, the elites within uh, the fortified uh, settlement communities would actually uh, uh, cre uh, introduce uh, cultural innovations uh, moral innovations and ethical rules, and even uh, you know administrative hierarchies, uh, so that uh, you know uh, people living within would all be forced to honor and respect and follow those uh, rules, norms, and so on, so that the people living within would not experience as much uh, you know, violence, uh, conflict, uh, as they would otherwise uh, be facing. So this is why you know, unintentionally, the civilizational process was triggered uh, with the formation of fortified community, uh, communities, uh, even though uh, the intention was not really to uh, jumpstart any such process. Okay, so by putting, uh, so according to uh, Mumford, uh, by putting power in some measure at the service of justice, the city brought order more swiftly into its internal affairs. So that's, uh, this nicely summarizes uh, the logic uh, we try to uh, uh, you know, uh, take as a given in this paper, that is, yes, uh, the formation of walled cities may not have been intended to develop uh, civilizational law and order, but indirectly, unintentionally, uh, they, uh, uh, the formation of walled cities uh, triggered uh, this uh, process of development. So a high degree of law and order achieved in complex Neolithic societies is a testimonial to the civilizing power uh, of the city. Okay, uh, so that's uh, a, 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 the basic logic uh, we want to keep in mind. And then correspondingly, uh, we can summarize the existing literature uh, into the following four uh, hypotheses, uh, which amounts to giving uh, those hypotheses that were developed in order to explain the, uh, the initial emergence of the political state. Uh, uh, but nonetheless, uh, we, we would like to give those uh, studies uh, some benefit of doubt, just to map uh, their hypothesis uh, from explaining uh, uh, the emergence of the state to explaining the emergence of early civilizations. Uh, okay, so so very quickly, uh, let me uh, uh, briefly mention the historical background uh, of um, the last ten thousand years of development uh, of uh, for China. Okay, so first, as uh, many of you know, uh, China. Uh, independently invented uh, sedentary agriculture uh, uh, in the lower uh, basins of uh, both the Yellow River and the, the Yangtze River uh, about uh, eight thousand, about ten thousand years ago, uh, so uh, around uh, eight thousand uh, BCE, and then uh, during the early Neolithic uh, period uh, from eight thousand to five thousand BCE, so far archaeologists have uh, discovered. Uh, 13 uh, walled cities, uh, and then some uh, 425 archaeological sites uh, across uh, uh, today's China. So not surprisingly, until, uh, until about 7,000 years ago, uh, there was some development in northern China, but not too much. Uh, and then we move on to the uh, the middle of Neolithic period or the uh, uh, Yangshao uh, uh, period, uh, then uh, much more development uh, emerged. So if you look at this map on the right-hand side, uh, you can see that uh, uh, not only uh, more cells or more regions in the north would become 
uh, uh, darker green in color, which means more uh, archaeological sites have been discovered from that period uh, in the different uh, northern uh, uh, regions, but not so much in the south. Uh, and then the purple dots uh, stand for the 56 uh, world cities uh, that have been discovered uh, from this period. Uh, out of the 56 world cities, uh, five of them are relatively large uh, because uh, each of the five world cities had uh, at least uh, one square kilometer uh, in size. So let me give you two uh, quick examples just to give you a sense of what those uh, mid-Neolithic uh, uh, world settlements uh, look like. Uh, the first example is um, uh, from uh, northern uh, Hunan province, okay, uh, Chentoshan, uh, in, uh, located in uh, uh, the uh, uh, city of today's uh, Changde. Uh, um, so this um, uh, wall city has uh, about 180,000 uh, square meters. So I went there last summer uh, to look at, uh, you know, the physical structure and, and so on. It's actually pretty big. I know uh, to many of us, uh, this uh, wall city has less than one square kilometer. It must, it would, it must be too tiny. But actually, it's much bigger than you can imagine. Okay, but if you look at the structure, so it's uh, so first of all, it's surrounded by uh, this uh, this circle of uh, moat, Hu uh, uh, in Chinese. Okay, and then. Next to the uh, moat, this uh, uh, a circle of uh, moat structure is this uh, city wall. Okay, so that's uh, reflected by this uh, city wall here, by this solid line. So this city wall uh, clearly served uh, uh, defensive uh, uh, purposes, and for the for most uh, segments of this city wall. Uh, it was uh, five meters wide, okay, five meters wide, uh, 2.5 uh, meters tall. Uh, it's a very uh, formidable structure, uh, especially, you know, when you think about the fact that this was constructed uh, uh, between 7,000 and uh, 5,500 years ago uh, before any metal tools uh, were available. So the locals had to use uh, stone tools or a wooden uh, uh, tools uh, or uh, animal bone tools uh, to uh, construct the moat and uh, the city wall. Uh, but social complexity uh, for this place uh, was not too high, uh, so not um, too many layers of uh, social hierarchy. Uh, and then another example uh, is from uh, today's uh, Henan province, uh, the Xishan uh, wall city. So this one is a little bit smaller uh, it has uh, only 34,500 uh, square meters uh, in area size, and it's uh, uh, from the um, Neolithic period, okay, at uh, the mid Neolithic period uh, between 7,000 and 5,000 years ago. Uh, but this one the structure is very similar. Uh, it has a moat, uh, 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 protective uh, infrastructure uh, outside. And then there is a gate uh, for going in and coming out of this uh, uh, wall city. And then the in, inside the moat is this uh, city wall. Okay. And then uh, uh, the, uh, the height uh, and width are reflectively given here. So uh, some of the uh, uh, some sections of this uh, city wall were uh, uh, between four and eleven meters wide, and the height. Uh, you know, it's pretty uh, uh, big, uh -huh, between three and uh, four point five meters uh, deep uh, for the moat, and then it has uh, or the city. Oh, no, sorry, uh, the height for the uh, wall uh, is uh, one between one point seven five and two point five uh, meters uh, tall. Okay, and then uh, of course, if we move on to the late Neolithic period or the so-called uh, Longshan period. Then um, the uh, you know between uh, 3000 and 1700 BCE, then many more uh, uh, wall cities uh, have been found uh, from this uh, uh, late Neolithic period. So altogether, 
128 world cities have been uh, uh, discovered and excavated uh, by archaeologists, and then uh, many more archaeological sites uh, uh, from this period. And then out of the city wall, uh, uh, the wall city, uh, out of the 128 wall cities, 13 of them have at least uh, uh, one uh, square kilometer in size. Uh, uh, nine of them uh, have more than two square kilometers in size, are uh, much bigger uh, in terms of uh, population uh, size uh, for uh, you know the interior uh, settlement uh, as well as in uh, scale. Uh, so here is one um, example, uh, one of my favorite examples so is uh, from uh, Shanxi province, uh, Taosu. Uh, uh, this is known to have uh, uh, flourished um, during the period between 2600 and 2000 BCE uh, from this Longshan period. Uh, so for this uh, uh, wall city uh, is uh, pretty big. Uh, it has uh, 2.8 Square kilometer, uh, uh, square kilometers in size, and the city wall uh, is seven kilometers long. Uh, so the city wall, the exterior city wall, is here, as you can see. Uh, uh, actually, there are two uh, two different uh, walls. Uh, there's one interior city wall and the external city wall. Uh, so it's pretty long altogether, uh, seven kilometers uh, 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 in length, okay? And then uh, some sections are uh, of the city wall are eight meters wide, okay? Um, and then the social complexity level uh, is very high. Uh, as you can see that uh, um, the, there is a clear uh, palace uh, city area, oops, uh, this, okay, sorry, let me try to get the uh, pointer back. Uh, so this is uh, the, oh, oops. Okay, so the, the uh, palace area is here. Uh, according to uh, Xu Hong, uh, according to his book, uh, this palace uh, area altogether uh, had uh, six palaces. Uh, and then uh, the uh, 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 commoners uh, residential area is to the north of the uh, uh, of the uh, palace uh, area as pointed out by this uh, uh, here, okay, so this is the communal residential area. And then uh, there is a, um, a mid-level elite residential region uh, or, or district uh, lying to the uh, 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 east at uh, the west of the palace area. And then the division of labor uh, is also very clear, okay. Uh, for example, you can see that this area here uh, is um, the uh, cemetery area and then the uh, storage uh, warehouse area for uh, food and other things is illustrated here. And then uh, handicraft uh, uh, production area is here to the uh, you know, south uh, of uh, this uh, wall city. Uh, anyway, uh, so this is a very, uh, this represents a very, uh, highly developed uh, complex society. So I hope uh, this general overview uh, gives you uh, uh, enough of um, uh, a, a sense of the uh, evolutionary process uh, of development from uh, 10,000 years ago all the way to roughly uh, uh, 4,000 years ago. Okay, but now let me show you uh, how we try to uh, prove uh, our main uh, uh, claim that uh, it is uh, warfare uh, that gave rise uh, to the emergence of early Chinese civilization. Uh, so in order to uh, do the proof, uh, uh, we need uh, uh, to uh, be very clear about what we use as the main uh, 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 object, uh, main outcome uh, we want to explain. 
and what we use as the explanatory variables. So first, the main outcome variable uh, is uh, defined by the number of walled cities uh, formed uh, do either during the Neolithic or during the Eastern Zhou period, okay? Uh, so that's the main uh, outcome variable. So, so, the, so if one region has uh, achieved uh, a large number of uh, walled settlements, then we view that area as uh, contributing uh, to the early emergence of uh, uh, the early Chinese uh, uh, civilization. Okay, if uh, an area had no walled cities uh, during the Neolithic or even during the Eastern Zhou period, then we would say that area did not participate in, uh, you know, triggering uh, the development of uh, the early Chinese civilization. And then the main explanatory variables uh, are first of all uh, are based on geography. Okay, terrain ruggedness. Uh, so that's uh, that captures whether uh, the uh, region's um, uh, landscape uh, was too uh, was too rugged, too uneven, too mountainous, or very flat. And then the second uh, explanatory variable uh, uh, is the number of military grave goods that have been uh, excavated by archaeologists uh, for the Neolithic period. Okay, uh, and then separately for the uh, Eastern Zhou period, we use this. Uh, as a proxy uh, for the uh, frequency of war threats during either the Neolithic or uh, during the Eastern Zhou period. And then we, uh, for the Eastern Zhou period, uh, uh, you know, because we have uh, 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 estimates of wars for each uh, region um, uh, by uh, uh, historians. So we use uh, actual uh, 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 war uh, frequency estimates by historians uh, for uh, the Eastern Zhou period. Uh, you know, I, I'm going to explain to you why uh, we want to uh, also spend some time on the Eastern Zhou period because that period has both uh, archaeological military grave goods and uh, historians' estimates of war frequencies. Uh, for each cell. So we then use the two variables to see whether, uh, you know, uh, our assumption that the number of military grave goods from uh, the Neolithic period makes sense or does not make sense. Uh, so uh, for that for that reason, uh, we, uh, you know, want to, uh, uh, you know, uh, keep uh, the experience of the Eastern Zhou period uh, uh, as a uh, as a robustness uh, uh, check, okay, for our exercise, okay. So first, uh, you want to uh, give you a sense, uh, a visual sense of uh, whether our claim makes sense that uh, you know northern China uh, has uh, generally many more flat uh, areas, okay, than in southern China. Uh, um, so we want to show you this, okay. So this map on the right, on the left hand side, okay, um, shows the following. The different green and blue colors stand for uh, the level of rocket, uh, terrain ruggedness. So the light green regions, okay. Uh, so you can see that the light green regions uh, uh, stand for relatively flat. Uh, uh, terrains, okay, and then uh, the somewhat darker uh, blue, uh, green regions or uh, cells uh, in between flat regions and mountainous regions, and then the deep uh, blue cells are really mountainous regions, okay, and then the yellow the yellow circles still stand for the number of walled cities that have been discovered by archaeologists uh, for the Neolithic period. So then you can see that, you know, most of the yellow circles, uh, uh, first of all, almost all the yellow circles lie along the Yangtze River and north of it, <clears throat> as we said before. And then secondly, <clears throat> many, uh, by far, many of the uh, yellow circles lie on uh, light green uh, cells, 
with a few exceptions, you know, some of them lie in the in between <clears throat> terrain ruggedness uh, uh, regions. Okay, so uh, this uh, uh, map on the left hand side uh, gives us uh, this uh, first uh, uh, visual support about our claim that uh, somehow uh, uh, flatter regions had. Uh, on average, uh, more <clears throat> walled cities uh, during the Neolithic period. But even during the uh, Eastern Zhou period, <clears throat> we still see a, an overly uh, high level of concentration of walled cities uh, in Northern China, <clears throat> with very few uh, emerging uh, in the South. Uh, so again, you know, most of these uh, yellow circles, right, lie in the very light uh, green regions, okay? So we also have other control variables uh, that we will use, including agricultural suitability uh, index uh, for rice, uh, for growing rice and millet, and then distance to the major rivers and average precipitation level for each cell, and then distance to the step, as many of you may have read from uh, history books that uh, somehow uh, to Chinese historians, uh, the threat, uh, the war threats from the nomads, uh, uh, from the uh, uh, Central uh, Asian regions and, and also Northern Asian regions, uh, you know, uh, defined uh, much of the uh, uh, Chinese history. Uh, so this is why we want to uh, have this uh, proxy variable, uh, uh, you know, capture, try to capture uh, the level of war threats from Northern nomads. Uh, so this is the distance to the step, okay. And then uh, in order to proxy for the um, uh, explanatory power uh, by the hydra uh, hydratic, uh, hydraulic civilization hypothesis proposed by uh, with Fogel, uh, we use the irrigation potential uh, index as uh, you know, the, uh, introduced by Benson and his co-authors uh, in their uh, 2017 paper. Okay, so let me skip to the baseline uh, uh, results. So here, the uh, uh, main uh, dependent variable or the outcome variable, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is the number of walled cities uh, during the Neolithic period. Okay, that's the main outcome variable to be explained. Uh, so one thing uh, is, first of all, very clear. That is, uh, you know, archaeological site density. So if we view uh, each cell's archaeological site density as a proxy uh, for the population density during the Neolithic period, then it is true that, you know, high population density regions on average ha had more walled cities built. So we have three stars, which means, uh, you know, statistic, which means uh, this population density or archaeological size density explan explanatory variable is statistically significant uh, uh, at the 99% uh, confidence level. Okay. And then uh, furthermore, when we interact uh, population density or archaeological site, uh, site density for each cell with the ruggedness uh, uh, indi index, then we get a statistically significant negative coefficient, which means uh, a region may have had a lot of residents, a lot of people living there, a lot of economic and other activities there. But if that region uh, was very mountainous, was very rugged in terms of the terrain uh, uh, geography, then not many walled cities would be built uh, because here the argument is that for uh, uh, mountainous areas, you know, nature gave the locals uh, this natural defense. Uh, uh, as you can imagine, you know, mountainous areas were very difficult to attack uh, and easy uh, to defend, okay? So which is why uh, people who were born into mountainous regions in the Neolithic period, as well as the early historic period, would find it unnecessary to construct human uh, uh, defensive barriers like uh, city walls, uh, because hey, uh, the mountains around uh, where uh, they were living would give them automatic 
natural protection. So that, of course, uh, gave them a lot of benefit. At the same time, uh, the uh, unintended consequence of them not engaging in civilization or development. But on the other hand, uh, for regions where you know the terrains were very flat, uh, but uh, they had a lot of people living there, then they had this tough challenge of uh, defending themselves, which uh, means that uh, they would have to construct uh, uh, artificial barriers uh, to defend themselves, so which gave rise to uh, early uh, fortified settlements, okay, as we uh, explained uh, before. So here's a quick summary of what we just learned from the uh, previous table. So flatter regions had more demand for defense and built and hence built more uh, walled cities. But this effect is much stronger <clears throat> with the high populations uh, as flat regions faced a uh, fewer options, okay. So now, of course, having established uh, the statistical uh, correlations uh, between uh, rockiness levels in terms of the local terrains and uh, the uh, 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 number of uh, walled uh, settlements uh, being constructed in the Neolithic period, so uh, next we need to establish this, uh, we, are, we need to answer this uh, channel question. So in other words, why did flat regions have to construct uh, 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 defensive walls? Um, so we need to uh, understand the channel through which flat lands forced the locals to construct uh, fortify settlements. So we want to propose uh, the wall explanation or the wall channel. But in order to uh, show uh, the wall channel being the reason, we need actual wall data. But of course, for the Neolithic period, there was no written uh, language uh, that was uh, invented yet. So we cannot rely on any uh, historical records uh, to help us. Uh, so instead, we want to rely on uh, archaeological data um, um, capturing, uh, telling us, uh, you know, what uh, burial, uh, what uh, uh, graves had, how many uh, military uh, weapons uh, that were, uh, uh, you know, kept uh, with the uh, the dead uh, inside a uh, grave. Uh, as excavated by archaeologists and so on. Uh, so some of you may wonder, uh, what uh, do weapons look like uh, from the Neolithic period? Here uh, is an example, uh, illustration from uh, uh, the Taosu uh, 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 walled city. Uh, so here are the uh, um, uh, bone daggers and the stone knife and stone arrowheads. Uh, so I'm realizing that I'm running out of time very quickly. And then um, uh, also from uh, the uh, Taosu uh, uh, wall city, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, some of the excavated uh, graves uh, had in them uh, jade uh, battle axe and then stone axes and bone arrows uh, as excavated uh, there. And then uh, from the later period of uh, during the Song Dynasty, which uh, goes from uh, 1600 to uh, 1050 BCE. So this is uh, uh, during the, uh, you know, uh, the middle uh, of the Bronze Age uh, for China, then uh, bronze weapons uh, became uh, uh, available, at least uh, in some regions uh, of uh, uh, China as well, you know, uh, besides uh, uh, bronze uh, swords, also bronze spears, uh, many of them have been uh, excavated from different uh, uh, archaeological uh, graves uh, across China. And then uh, by the time when uh, the Eastern Zhou Dynasty uh, ended, uh, then uh, bronze and uh, uh, even iron technology uh, uh, was available uh, in many parts of China. So bronze chariots, uh, as uh, you know, excavated uh, from the um, uh, the Qin Emperor's uh, tomb. Okay. So anyway, so that gives you a sense of uh, the evolution of uh, uh, weapons uh, over different uh, time periods. Okay. And then. 
more, what is uh, more interesting for us is uh, the spatial distribution uh, of those uh, excavated military grave goods. Uh, so what we did is to uh, uh, first take, uh, you know, uh, uh, write down and collect uh, all the um, uh, grave uh, military grave goods that have been excavated from graves across China, and then we count uh, the total number of military graves that have been excavated. Uh, for example, here for the uh, Neolithic period, uh, within each uh, cell uh, region. Uh, then you can see, like uh, for the Neolithic period, the spatial distribution of the uh, military grave goods uh, uh, is heavily uh, concentrated uh, in northern China, uh, with very few uh, in southern China. But even during the uh, you know the Eastern Zhou period, many of the military grave goods uh, lie in northern China. Very few uh, coming from uh, the uh, the south. Uh, so that that gives you a sense uh, of where war threats must have mostly lied uh, in China during both the Neolithic period and the Eastern Zhou period. Of course, some of you may wonder, why do you use uh, uh, the number of military grave goods as a proxy for war threats? Uh, the uh, reason is very simple. You know, who would care uh, enough uh, for weapons so that uh, after uh, he uh, dies, he would want to take some weapons into his graves, right? So, the, so for locals to care so much about weapons that they would like to take some weapons into the graves, uh, before they died, uh, war threats must have been such a day-to-day -day, uh, uh, concern uh, in their uh, livelihood. Uh, so this is the main reason for us to rely on the number of military grave goods as a proxy uh, for war threats. Uh, uh, okay, uh, some of you may wonder whether we can actually show you evidence. So here, as I mentioned earlier, for the Eastern Zhou period, we have both uh, archaeological military grave goods data and uh, historians' estimates uh, for actual wars that took place within each cell. So here on this map, uh, there are two colors. The purple colors stand for the number of uh, military grave goods uh, from the Eastern Zhou period. And then the yellow colors uh, and the red colors stand for uh, the number of wars uh, as estimated by uh, historians. Uh, so you can see that uh, both military grave goods and most of the wars are, are concentrated uh, in northern China. Uh, so then we do this uh, two-stage regression. First, uh, we regress uh, the number of military grave goods during the Neolithic period on terrain rockedness levels and uh, other explanatory variables, including uh, step distance or st distance to the step and then uh, irrigation potential. And then what you can see is that um, the higher the uh, terrain rockiness level, uh, the fewer military grave goods uh, have been excavated uh, for a given cell, for a given region. So what that means is, you know, flat regions have lower terrain rockiness index values, right? So, so those flatter regions had more uh, military grave goods that have been uh, uncovered uh, by uh, 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 by um, uh, uh, archaeologists. Okay, and then we use the uh, predicted value for the number of military grave goods for each region to further predict or explain the number of walled cities uh, during the Neolithic period for each cell. Then we get this very uh, significant. Uh, positive uh, coefficient estimate uh, uh, under different, uh, you know, research uh, design specifications. Uh, so basically, uh, uh, regions with uh, more military grave goods uh, predicted uh, had uh, more uh, city uh, uh, formations uh, there. Okay, so this is exactly giving support uh, to our main claim. Uh, so. I understand that I have one minute left. Let me just skip the um, 
the exercise uh, repeated um, uh, based on uh, the Eastern Zhou uh, period data in order to prove that it is the wall channel that gave rise uh, to uh, the formation uh, of early uh, walled uh, cities and fortified settlements. Uh, but I do want to show you uh, one uh, uh, last uh, horse race exercise. Uh, so in other words, uh, is the wall channel really uh, fully capturing the effect of geography, that is uh, terrain uh, ruggedness levels or flatness uh, of uh, each area? Uh, and that, that's the first uh, question we want to address uh, through this horse race, uh, horse race uh, exercise. So we include both the uh, uh, terrain ruggedness level and the number of uh, wars during the uh, Eastern Zhou period uh, to explain uh, the uh, 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 variation in each uh, cells number um, of wall cities. Then indeed what you see is that once we include both of them, uh, both of the explanatory variables uh, together, then it's, the, it's only uh, the, um, uh, the number of walls for each cell that were ex uh, experienced during the Eastern Zhou period that remains statistically significant, uh, but the terrain ruggedness significance level is fully uh, uh, captured uh, by uh, the number of uh, uh, walls that was that were experienced. Uh, so the terrain ruggedness uh, variable is no longer significant. So that's the first. Uh, uh, um, uh, conclusion uh, we want to get uh, out of this uh, horse race exercise. What about uh, the nomadic uh, threats uh, from the steppe, uh, from the north? Did they play any role in um, uh, uh, early city formation during the Eastern Zhou period? So in order to answer this question, we look at the statistical significance for this uh, variable uh, distance to the steppe. Uh, so indeed, uh, uh, regions that uh, that were closer uh, to the steppe, uh, closer to the uh, northern uh, 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 nomadic tribes, uh, were more likely to construct uh, uh, defensive uh, city walls. Uh, so that's uh, consistent with uh, the uh, explanation proposed by uh, historians. But of course, uh, this is only true for the Eastern Zhou period. Uh, but for the Neolithic period, uh, this variable is not significant. What about lastly, uh, the Wittfogel uh, uh, hydraulic civilization hypothesis? Well, uh, you can see that uh, this irrigation potential variable is significant in explaining uh, how many uh, uh, wall cities were formed uh, in each cell uh, during the Eastern Zhou period, except the side of this coefficient is totally wrong. It's totally the opposite uh, uh, of what Wittfogel's hypothesis would predict. That is, uh, regions that had more irrigate that had higher irrigation potential actually constructed fewer walled cities. So, so this shows that even by the Eastern Zhou period the uh, irrigation uh, uh, factor, the irrigation need, irrigation management considerations were not uh, a major factor uh, for the formation uh, of uh, city walls. Uh, so this goes against uh, many of the uh, archeologists uh, trying to prove that is the uh, irrigation management need that gave rise to uh, uh, city walls uh, in uh, pre-Chinese history and, and, and early Chinese history. Okay, just quickly, uh, here's the conclusion. So uh, what you can take away is that flatter lands in Northern China made the locals uh, more subject to war threats, forcing them to construct uh, defensive walls, uh, which accidentally uh, created uh, the early cradles of civilization. And secondly, war, so it is warfare that was the main trigger of the emerge, for the emergence uh, of walled cities. So war led to the rise 
of early Chinese civilization. So let me uh, stop here. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Zhu, um, for the talk. Um, we have a little bit lost for about uh, five minutes, so I would suggest that we can have a quick discussion between Chen Shu and you, and later on we can uh, still have time for uh, the four questions that we have now on the Q&A session. Okay, so what we'll do now is to invite Chen Shu to give his comment to this presentation. Yes, Chen Shu, please. Okay, thank you for invitation to discuss Professor Chen's work. Um, I'm Chen Shuo from Fudan University. Um, uh, so at first, I want to brief uh, repeat the research question and the finding of this work. Uh, this work is also based on the systematic uh, agriological site data to test the role of uh, the wall in shaping Chinese earlier civilization. And the paper finds that the war is a major driven force in the evolution of complex societies. Okay, uh, that is my comment and uh, suggestion. Okay, wait a minute. Um, I stop the and uh, try to get uh, Hey, can you help me and uh, see my screen? Uh, no, we cannot oh. see your screen. Earlier we can see, we could see your screen, yeah, but not anymore. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, now it's back. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is working now. Okay. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> My screen doesn't work. Maybe you can try to share that particular um, PowerPoint app instead of sharing your des desktop. Because sometimes if you share in your desktop, it, it just won't work on your slides. Okay, that's okay. Okay. It's moving up, yeah. Okay. Um, so to the implication of this work, I think it's a very important one because uh, it provides the direct evidence from the China for the, the very famous slogan, the wall making state literature. And uh, most of the existing literature focus on the, uh, the long-term effect of civilization, focus on the broken age. And uh, in terms of China, the existing literature mainly focus on the development of productivity. The story is agriculture surplus linked to the cities. So it's all, it's, it's, it's belong to the classical Marxism pers perspective. And uh, there is a famous slogan in Chinese history in uh, the usage of history is to get some lessons and experience from history. But if we uh, want to use, uh, describe this term in economic, it is so-called the past dependence. So that is the very initial uh, condition is very important to shape the later development. Okay. And uh, that, that has come to my comment. Uh, the first comment is about um, hy competing hypotheses. Um, the paper argues that the flat, the terror, the great the threat of war, thus giving rise to of the civilization. Uh, a second uh, story maybe has come, come to um, the ancient northern China had a more flat climate compared to the north. So, uh, therefore, the better suited to the development of civilization. And uh, there is a third story is 
Um, the flatter the terror is also means that the cost of building infrastructure is low and uh, the extent of the infra infrastructure are higher and the governance cost is less due to the, uh, due to the easy ease of access. So all their factors can um, play some role to shape the civilization organization. Okay, so my suggestion is, is, is to rule out their alternative hypotheses. Uh, the first suggestion is to uh, control for as much as we, we have the weather factor in empirical analysis. And the second one is, uh, I think the sub-sample sub analysis is useful to compare the difference in coefficient between area with little transportation but many words and the area with little transportation, but few words to com compare the, the, the difference of coefficient to look up to whether or not other uh, factor play the role. Um, the second comment is about the counter factor. Um, the Yellow River and the Young's River um, in this empirical analysis is very is akin um, to find the, the existing baseline result. Um, but their area are not only flat, but also have a favorable climate, easily access to transportation and uh, abundance of fresh water and the uh, fisheries resources, all of, all of which are linked to man lead to civilization. So my suggestion is use other water shells as possible test. For example, use the subsample of pure river area. If the result from their area is not significant, um, it could indicate that their rule played by other uh, factors such as climate, transportation, fresh water, so on and so forth, would not change the baseline result. Okay. Um, the three, the, the, the third, um, Suggestion is about mechanism. Um, the mechanism in this paper is uh, used two ways. The first method is the interaction term, and uh, very easy going. And the second one is the IV. Um, as far as the interaction term is concerned, ending the interaction with population review that the more rugged the terror is, the more world civilization they are for a uh, consistent, uh, constant population size. However, the story uh, can be positive or negative. Uh, the more rugged, so, uh, uh, um, such as the more rugged the terror, the few cities for constant population. So we should discuss, discuss in the paper more uh, in this point. As to the IV, um, authors use terror as IV for the threat of war. Uh, we should discuss more about exclusive uh, exclusivity um, because the terror affects civilization through uh, many uh, ways, and it also has direct rule, um, direct effect on civilization itself. Okay, and uh, the last uh, major comment is about uh, measurement error. This paper finds that the productivity as well as irrigation do not explain the formation of world civilization well. Um, but to my opinion, I think maybe the result is most likely because of the units are too large. I think the one kilometer plus one kilometer is not uh, a small one. So my suggestion is conduct some robust test using a little smaller degrees, such as 10 kilometers plus 10 kilometers. Okay. Um, there's other uh, minor uh, uh, suggestion. <clears throat> I, the first one is... Uh, Clarify about figure one. The figure one on the period of, 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 of 8,000 to um, 3,000 BCE is also suggested to be shown. And it seems that the number of human sites from this, this period is, is in decreased rapidly. So I, I, I'm very crucial about it and uh, look for and, and uh, want to the, the author need to explain more. Um, uh, a second one is about now and Puga, the, the calculation is smaller, is similar to the finding the standard deviation of uh, elevation of one grade from the uh, elevation of its uh, around grades. So it's maybe it's not the same concept as the slope calculation. So I suggest the author should highlight the difference and uh, define clearly the difference with uh, the non and the pogas. Last one is 
um, the indicator using in basin um, to measure the difference between the maximum green yield that can be achieved in the region entirely by rain fed irrigation and uh, the maximum yield that can be achieved by by human being so i to my opinion that is this indicator is somehow um somehow uh, not the same uh, about the presence of irrigation facility in the area so it's a different uh, indicator so even if not significant the impact of irrigation or demand for irrigation on civilization um, also cannot be ruled out. So the, I look forward to the discussion, many more caution. Okay, let's uh, move to the last one is, I think um, um, the migration discussed by author, uh, authors in this paper is very inspiring because we don't have any detail record about migration in this, er in this period. So, um, but uh, this point uh, raised some concern. Um, because, for example, the population migrate uh, brings some weapon to peaceful area where there is actually no war. So it is just there, just brings the, the, the weapon there. And the second one is culture trans transfer. Um, the people, the people um, have a culture to build up the, the war civilization, move to other places. They just build the wall here just because depend on their formal culture. Okay. So in the sum, this is a very interesting idea with seismic data and the solid evidence and the story is, is credible, the conclusion is credible. So in sum, it is very uh, enlightening work. And uh, I remember clearly that Professor Chen gave a talk about the long-term effect of uh, uh, initial condition on long, it developed two years ago in Fudan. And uh, um, there is already a series of related paper here. So I hope to see more in the future and the advance of our understanding of Chinese history. This is all my comment and the suggestion. Yeah, um, thank you, Chen Shuo. Um, so do you, you want to give a quick response in about uh, yeah, one, three so, minutes? Yeah, Chen Shuo, uh, uh, thank you very much. So the, um, the, the, the many points you have raised are uh, very, very uh, uh, interesting, very useful. So we're going to go through uh, each one of them. Uh, but let me just uh, respond to a couple of uh, your points uh, so that uh, uh, people in the audience can uh, see that, uh, you know, some of the things we have addressed or, or uh, you know, may, may uh, anyway, so we, we, sh we can do more work on them. Uh, uh, one is um, about the um, Yellow River uh, Basin and the Yangtze River Basin being uh, more uh, suitable for humans to uh, live there. And then, uh, so that's why uh, naturally, uh, you know, they had more population growth and more population concentration. And then uh, uh, civilizational development uh, to take place there first rather than in the South. Uh, but of course, um, you know, being very nice and and uh, very accommodating uh, to humans um, can also mean yeah more wars there yeah because you know just like uh, Hong Kong uh, if Hong Kong is so attractive to so many people so everyone wants to come here uh, and then that leads to a lot of uh, conflicts and then um, you know such fighting even between and among different uh, uh, districts in Hong Kong can easily take place uh, because uh, many you know, resources would become much more limited, right? So, so but of course that uh, possible channel uh, for explaining why um, uh, flat regions uh, may have more wars and then uh, you know, that would get them to start civilization or development early on. Uh, would be very consistent uh, with uh, our story, with uh, with what we have shown uh, uh, in this uh, work. And then um, regarding, um, let me see. Uh, yeah, let me move to uh let me let me pick a couple of other points uh regarding uh, uh measurement error related to um 
uh, the size of each cell, um, 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer, uh, you know, that's that may be too big. I know many other uh, quantitative historians don't use such big uh, cell uh, grids. Um, but on the other hand, I guess uh, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer uh, cells would be too small. I mean, I, I I run every almost every other day for 10 kilometers. So that would just mean that the distance is just too small to really reflect a lot of uh, uh, environmental, geographical, and uh, and, and other uh, uh, variations in difference. But we, I think we tried 50 kilometer by 50 kilometer cells. Uh, the results uh, are very similar. Um, so, but we can experiment with uh, more uh, possible combinations. Uh, your point is where we're taken uh, in terms of um, uh, looking at different sub periods instead of treating the whole uh, Neolithic period from 8,000 BCE to uh, mm -hmm. 1700 BCE as one. In an earlier version of the paper, yeah, we uh, we divided the Neolithic period into three sub periods: uh, the early Neolithic mid-Neolithic and late Neolithic, the results are, are, are very similar, except maybe for the early Neolithic, there were just not many um, archaeological sites uh, or uh, uh, fortified uh, cities. So it would not make sense there uh, to use uh, the early Neolithic because the results would be highly uh, statistically suspicious, right? Because only 13 uh, walled, uh, only 13 small a world settlements uh, from the early Neolithic, then that would just make most of the uh, cells or regions uh, uh, just have a value of zero. Uh, and then, you know, you, you can uh, open up uh, a lot of uh, room for uh, a statistical debating. Um, and regarding the uh, ruggedness uh, uh, measure, uh, out of uh, the Nan and Puga paper. Yeah, we, we, we tried different ways um, to uh, uh, construct rockiness uh, uh, values based on their very small cell uh, 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 elevation uh, estimates. Mm -hmm. uh, the results are, are, are pretty similar. We actually also experimented with um, Chinese uh, geogra uh, geographers uh, uh, subjective plus objective assessments because there is a data set that gives uh, that has some number for each uh, county of China in terms of right going from let's say uh, as, uh, ten to one uh, one being very flat and ten being very mountainous um, the results are very similar uh, when we use uh, those uh, geographers. Uh, mostly subjective uh, ratings uh, of the um, ruggedness level um, uh, of each uh, county. Uh, okay. And then uh, just very quickly, uh, yeah, I think the the irrigation potential um, result, uh, I, I think for the most part, um, you mentioned that, um, uh, you know, the um, Benson, uh, function for irrigation uh, potential is mostly based on uh, rain-fed uh, uh, farming. Um, but the, I think the um, much of the uh, uh, Witt-Fogel hypothesis and also the more modern justification for why irrigation management should have given rise to uh, uh, complex society and then later to uh, the rise of uh, uh, state polities, right? Um, so, yeah, food production was the main motivation there. Uh, but uh, as I mentioned in the presentation, uh, at least uh, for the uh, Eastern Zhou period, uh, the irrigation potential uh, coefficient uh, has the wrong sign. <laughs> it's minus rather than positive. So, so at least uh, up until uh, the Eastern Zhou period, maybe the Chinese population was uh, was not that big. I mean, after all, according to some historians, 
Uh, there were about what between five to ten million people living across uh, the vast land uh, of China. Uh, so you know the the need for really large scale irrigation farming was probably not so much there. Of course, later on. Uh, as the population increased uh, over the, the different historical periods, uh, then the need for irrigation really rose uh, to a very, uh, you know, uh, uh, high level. So that uh, indeed uh, irrigation management became a very uh, important uh, driver uh, for a tougher uh, government uh, 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 controls and management. Uh, which would mean that uh, the state administration would have to be given much more power and so on. But I, I think for the uh, prehistoric and early historic periods, at least uh, our uh, different uh, papers show that irrigation was actually not so much a big uh, driver uh, or concern. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Chen Shuo, so for the wonderful okay. suggestion. So we're... Uh, yeah, we're going to spend more time on, on on your points later. Okay. Yeah, um, thank you both for um, the interesting discussion. So I do have quite a lot of questions here. Um, we can overrun a little bit, but I would suggest that uh, to you to give uh, a one minute response to each of the questions so that we can try to uh, cover all of them. So for the three short questions from uh, Kenneth and uh, Alice, I will put them at the end because they will be um, pretty much straightforward. Uh, so, so let's uh, start with a question from Feng Yintong. Uh, how would haunting tools or ritual and symbolic? Okay, so, uh, sorry, like? in order to save time, let me uh, take a few yeah, okay. uh, from the uh, uh, questions that have been posted. Uh, yeah, there's one from uh, Kenneth Lee, right? The size of a typical family uh, unit. Yeah, that's tough to get because uh, from the graves, uh, some of the graves had uh, multiple uh, people buried. So it's tough to know whether they were family members or uh, servants or, or others. Yeah, it's tough to uh, address this. Then Yin Tong's uh, question, uh, how were hunting tools or ritual and symbolic weapon uh, like uh, artifacts distinguished from actual weapons uh, for the grave goods considered? Did this study consider all these tools as weapons? Uh, very good question, a very important question. The short answer is that we don't use, uh, uh, we don't do any judgment. Uh, we rely on the archeological uh, excavation reports uh, written by archeologists. So if those archeologists who were doing the digging of a particular grave, uh, uh, you know, classified some of the objects as weapons, uh, then we take them as weapons in our uh, database. Uh, so we we uh, uh, did not apply any of our judgment. Uh, so that's totally independent of our study. And then uh, uh, Richard uh, McCabe, uh, could the density of discovered grave goods reflect the relative difficulty of archaeological excavation of relevant sites? Um, yeah, that's uh, interesting. Of course, uh, you know, I, I, I forgot to mention that uh, uh, most people don't know that China over the last uh, 30 years has had by far the most archaeological excavations and most archaeological discoveries, uh, partly because of the large scale infrastructure projects, like the highway uh, 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 network and the high speed train network and many uh, real estate buildings and city subways and so on. All of those uh, infrastructure projects led to a lot of unintended discoveries of archeological sites. And, and also, uh, you know, to my uh, knowledge, uh, every piece of land uh, of China that could be used for uh, uh, growing uh, uh, grains, uh, for farming or for real estate construction up to this point has been used up. So, so in other words, uh, yeah, I would say, uh, you know, prehistoric humans living uh, in uh, on today's Chinese land, uh, uh, if they could find some place to be livable for them, I'm, I can assure you that those places uh, must have been uh, tremendously over exploited uh, for real estate development, for farming, and other development. So. 
uh, I would not, uh, I mean, it, it, the issue you you raised is very important to keep in mind, but I think for uh, the Chinese case uh, of archaeological discoveries yeah, is probably less uh, a concern. Um, uh, so Alice Wong uh, asks, what were the reasons for war? Uh, just like uh, in modern times, uh, some countries want to fight uh, to start wars against others uh, for non-material reasons. But I think you know, in the prehistoric times, uh, probably most of the wars were driven by uh, survival challenges uh, when they experienced, uh, you know, uh, food shortage and so on. Uh, that they realized that uh, the next uh, tribe, the next village, would have a lot of uh, food uh, grains stored in their uh, stores, uh, in their caves. Then just, you know, launching an attack on them and and uh, take away all their food storage would help uh, survival, right? Um, Okay, uh, Jacqueline asks, uh, I was wondering if the rice and millet suitability variables are not correlated with the irrigation potential variable. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for, for bringing this up. Actually, uh, this, you know, so Chen Shuo also mentioned quite a few um, uh, uh, points uh, that are related to this, uh, to what you are asking uh, here. So I would say, you know, by including, um, uh, the uh, 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 rice and millet suitability and uh, precipitation uh, indices and so on. I, I think we have controlled for some of those effects uh, at the least. Uh, and then um, uh, Long Jung Li um, asks, weapons can be uh, used as military tools as well as hunting tools. We know, yeah, actually, yeah, In Tong asked a similar a question. So, so here, the short answer is, uh, yeah, we rely on um, uh, archaeologists' uh, assessment uh, to determine uh, whether something uh, was uh, a military uh, weapon uh, or military tool or not. Okay. Uh, Andrew Chung, um, are there similar studies and conclusions in, uh, I mean, uh, okay, let me see. Sorry, sorry, I just clicked the wrong button. Yeah, uh, in other ancient civilizations such as uh, uh, around Mesopotamia and the Nile, to my knowledge, no. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to uh, apply our research design to uh, data from Mesopotamia and the Nile uh, region or, or basin. Um, you know, as long as they can, um, as long as there are uh, archaeological reports. Uh, for the different uh, grave goods, then we can uh, do uh, a similar exercise. But based on my reading of the relevant uh, literature and also examination of the terrain um, uh, features, uh, at least for Mesopotamia, it's very similar, uh, as, as uh, many of you know. Uh, the first uh, cities, the first walled cities uh, in Mesopotamia uh, came up mostly uh, uh, on those uh, alluvial plains, on those uh, flat uh, lands. Uh, I imagine that they faced very similar challenges as um, uh, our Chinese ancestors uh, faced uh, in the Central Plains, uh, Chengdu Plains, and then um, the Zhanghan Plains and uh, the Taihu Plains. Uh, so my suspicion is that uh, uh, a similar hypothesis can actually be supported, at least uh, with data, uh, by data from uh, Mesopotamia. Uh, then Nikolai Khan, um, many thanks for uh, advancing the problem. Um, here, it is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting problem. Uh, combination of fresh water and irrigation, uh, their influence for growth of Chinese civilization. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Um, and then uh, Lin, Lin Zhehao, uh, as far as I know, ancient Chinese cities were basically political. Uh, could the political nature of cities uh, lead to cities being inherently associated with the war? Uh, yeah, every city involved uh, uh, some politics uh, because, uh, you know, as I mentioned earlier, once you have a lot of people living within a very narrow space, 
uh, uh, conflicts uh, would arise. Uh, so then you need to, uh, to select uh, a leader uh, in some way and empower the leader with some power and then uh, the administrative bu bureaucracy to help him uh, uh, do the governance and leading. Uh, so that, of, of course, would create uh, what we uh, modern people would call politics uh, within uh, a walled city. Um, so I'm sorry, I think uh, we are five minutes beyond the scheduled yes. uh, stopping time. Let me let me stop here. There are a few more questions, but uh, yeah, sorry, we're out of time. But thank you for uh, your questions and comments. Yeah. Yeah, we will just make sure all the questions will be delivered to the professor afterwards because we will have the recording also, uh, the, the manuscript. So we will deliver your questions later on. Okay, so um, yeah, let me just uh, call it an end to today's session. And um, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I believe we do have a very uh, warm discussion here, not just between Chen Shu and, and, and Xu, but also from the online audience. Um, so for, the, for our next upcoming events, uh, we have Liu Tong to uh, speak about her research on Go Native foreign firms' responses to uh, domestic boycotts. Uh, that will be on the 25th of April. Um, and yeah, um, again, uh, a very big thanks to uh, Chen Shu and also to Chu for today's session. And thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Mm.